for Creamer Media's policy, Amlum Kilen Gomfe. Joining me in studio is author and journalist Mark Gavissa, here to discuss his latest book called The Revolution Will Not Be Litigated. Mark, thank you for your time. It's great to be with you, Lumkile. Thank you. So, Mark, the book details narratives from movement lawyers and activists from around the world. Can you briefly describe some of the human rights abuses captured in the book? It's the whole scope we set out to explore the way legal power and people power work together by looking across the scope at a wide breadth of different struggles in different areas of human rights abuse. So it's everything from female genital cutting in South Africa to the violation of indigenous rights, rights to land and property in, in Mexico and North America, to abortion rights, to um, in South Africa we look at the, the treatment action campaign and the right to uh, HIV medication. Uh, there's a lot about the climate crisis as well. There's a lot about environmental justice and looking at the way, for example, in a country like Myanmar or Burma, uh, multinational corporations have colluded with the government to violate people's rights to the point of rape and murder to get them off the land so that an oil pipeline can be built. We, we have an amazing interview with a, a Russian human rights lawyer who talks about how impossible it is to defend human rights in Putin's Russia. We've got a, a, an incredible essay by a Lebanese activist talking about the rights of detainees in Lebanon. So we've got a, a, an interview with a, a Kenyan LGBTQ rights activist talking about fighting for the rights to equality for queer Kenyans. So like a, a huge canvas, an essay from a leader of the Black Lives Matter movement looking at um, the rights of young black Americans, particularly men, to life because of the way uh, there are so many police murders. And to what extent do you think that courts around the world deliver on immediate transformative solutions to human rights abuses? Well, I think one of the key points about this book, and it's a point that all the contributors make, is, is that courts cannot deliver alone. So there's a very clear and wonderful example that Mark Hayward from South Africa gives when he looks at two absolutely critical socioeconomic rights judgments made by the Constitutional Court in South Africa in its first years. The one was the TAC in the European case, which led to um, the opening up of HIV medication to pregnant mothers to prevent transmission to their children, something that Thabo Mbeki had stood in the way of doing because of his belief that HIV didn't cause AIDS. And that had an immediate effect. And one of the reasons why that had an immediate an effect was that there was a movement on the ground out of which that case came uh, that made sure that the judgment was implemented. But Mark Hayward compares that to the Grootboom case, which was another signal case, one of the best judgments the Constitutional Court has ever given, which is around the rights to housing. And we can see how that's gone in this country. Those rights are still really, really, really hard to claim, even though the court has, has ruled that it is a fundamental basic human right of all South Africans. And Mrs. Grootboom herself, who was the, the, the claimant, actually died homeless. Um, and the reason for that, Mark Hayward says, is that there wasn't at the time a grassroots movement for the rights to housing that would make sure that the case was implemented. Can you highlight some of the litigation strategies employed by human rights lawyers in order to reach a successful outcome? Well, I suppose the first question is, Lumkile, how do we define a successful outcome? I was at a launch of my book, and the wonderful, really wonderful head of the Socioeconomic Rights Initiative in Johannesburg, which is a, a big housing rights, mainly, organization, and which has done really important work in downtown Johannesburg, but they've also defended the families of the Marikana victims. And, and she made the point that I thought was really powerful, was that they have not had justice within the courtroom for these Marikana victims, but they still believe that they have won something, which is that through these court cases and through the space 
that these court cases give the litigants to tell their story, to use the court and the case as a communicative means to the broader public. Marikana has been lodged in South Africa's national story as something never to be forgotten and never to be repeated. And therefore, even though uh, they lost in the courtroom, they won in the court of public opinion. And so when one's looking at success, one's got to look at that. So a key question that one needs to ask if one's doing any kind of st strategic impact litigation is what effect is this going to have on the public discourse, win or lose? And smart um, activists and lawyers make a call. Well, even if we lose, we win. So I tell the example in my book. It's a story that's told by Felista Abdallah, who's a sex workers' rights um, activist in Kenya. And they are, they are going to court to use the Constitution to say that sex work should be legalized. Now, she knows that she's going to lose. They know they're going to lose, but they're doing it anyway. Why are they doing it? Because the case will give sex workers a human face. Sex workers will be able to describe how they are mothers and workers rather than sinners and evil people. Now, what is your assessment of the relationship between social movements and the rule of law? And do you think that the rule of law adequately serves the downtrodden? You know, one of the points that's made by so many of the contributors to this book is that the rule of law is often based on very discriminatory and oppressive principles. So just for example, um, there's an indigenous rights activist from the United States called Crystal Tubules, who makes the point that the American Constitution is founded on the doctrine of discovery, which is what the settlers originally used when they conquered the United States and killed her people in a genocide. So, so that rule of law um, in the United States, which is now used to uphold people's rights, um, is, is built on those very dodgy principles. And we could say the same about our own constitution. I mean, we did our best in our constitution to embody uh, democratic values. Uh, but there is so much that is unequal in our society that cannot be rectified using the constitution. Um, if one looks, for example, at the way the Constitution balances the rights to property and the rights to land, or tries to balance that in terms of restitution. And, and the rule of law has been, I mean, the apartheid state was a rule of law. Um, Nazi Germany was a rule of law. So the rule of law does, does not necessarily, in principle, serve the downtrodden. Uh, it's also really difficult for um, marginalized or poor people to access the resources that enable them to have their rights, their rights which are inherent, affirmed by the rule of law. So these are all challenges. But the rule of law is also an extraordinary thing to be able to use. And we can see in South Africa how powerfully it is being used by social movements to affect social change. And the key, the sort of secret source, if you like, spoken about in these contributions is how what happens um, in a legal process is part of a broader movement for social change that happens on the street or in communities or outside of the courtroom through the media as well. Because there's always a, a, an awkward dance in any society between social change and legal reform. And we in South Africa have really pushed forward with the legal reform and, and are using the legal reform to try and affect social change, right? With, with mixed results, with mixed results. We, we have this constitution and now we all have to live up to the constitution. A more organic way is for, um, for norms to change and then out of those norms changing, laws are made and jurisprudence happens uh, so that the values are kind of lodged in the people and in communities. And it's, it, it can't be one or the other. It's an iterative process. They work together, sort of norm changing and social change and legal reform and legal change. But the one can't happen without the other. Can you mention a few of the rules for radical lawyers that Katie Redford discusses? 
so this book was initiated by Katie Redford, who is a movement lawyer, but who was looking for somebody to work with her because she understood and, and we understood that, as we say in the slogan on the cover of the book, it takes a lawyer, an activist, and a storyteller to affect positive social change. So she was the lawyer activist, I'm the storyteller. And w the people we include in this book are a combination of activists and lawyers, but we help them all become storytellers. But at the core of what Katie wanted to put forward in this book was a series of rules for radical lawyers, which she doesn't, she, she, she's very clear that you shouldn't think of them as inviolate rules, but, but what are the ways that a lawyer should work if a lawyer is working for social justice. And her point as somebody who went to law school and is also taught in law schools is that these are principles that law students are not taught, which is one of the main reasons why we made this book, to give resources to people who are studying the law and want to understand how to use it. So her rules are, the first rule is make common cause with others. And the second rule is begin with a vision for genuine change. Think strategically. Uh, another important rule is it's all about power. And, and that is about before you go into any um, case, before you decide to use the law in, in litigation, figure out who's got the power, what power you have, what power your opponent has, and how you can shift the balance of power. She says that's a very important rule. A rule of hers that I really value, and I try and use it in my own work as a storyteller, is listen to understand rather than to argue. If you're having a conversation with somebody, um, even with it's an, if it's with an adversary, try and understand where they're coming from rather than thinking, as lawyers are so often trained to do, what is the hole in their argument that I can like get in there and prove that they're wrong? Try and understand where they're coming from. Because even if they're your opponent, if you understand where they're coming from, then you'll have a clearer sense about how to counter them with reason and logic and evidence. So that's another one of her rules. And then, then of course, a, a key rule, um, particularly for this book and for the project of It Takes a Lawyer, an Activist and a Storyteller, is embrace the power of storytelling, not just as a legal strategy, but as a form of justice itself. It's the, it's the form of justice that happens. It's a kind of restitution. You know, there's this wonderful phrase, I'll have my day in court. That means I'll finally be able to tell my story before a supposedly impartial adjudicator. I mean, they're often not, right? But there is a, a concept that we explore in this book, uh, which we call narrative justice. And it's about the power of having your story told when your story has been denied or suppressed. And that's part of the way your rights has been have been violated. Now, what are the challenges that the human rights lawyers and activists have encountered in their pursuit of social justice? Well, one of the key challenges is the um, reaction from powers that be, whether those powers are, are in the corporate capitalist sector, whether those powers are the state. And often, those powers have a lot more resources than human rights lawyers and human rights activists do. So it's like, I'm a little guy defending my little people against this big corporation who brings out the heavy gun lawyers and can also like, keep us in court for years and bankrupt us. So there, are, there, there, is a, there is a category of case which was labeled in the United States, but it's happening increasingly in South Africa, called a slap suit, strategic litigation against public participation. And what this is, is when the powerful, whether it is the state, or, or corporations, knows that they probably don't have a case, that they're probably going to lose, but they tie their opponents up in these endless cases that exhaust their opponents, um, bankrupt their opponents, and, and often just cause their opponents to sort of scuttle off with their tail between their legs because they just don't have the resources to fight back. And, and that, that's a huge challenge that human rights lawyers and, and activists face when they're using the law. Um, there are many others as well. Uh, and another one which many of our writers write about is, is like we just assume when we think about human rights lawyers that they're working in an environment where the rule of law exists. 
and where there's a human rights dispensation. So um, we have an essay from a Chinese environment rights lawyer about how impossible it is to use human rights law in China. Even though she's a, she has a human rights focus, she uses environmental law because human rights law, forget it. But even with environmental law, I mean, the state controls everything in China. So what she now does is, is that she fights the Chinese state in jurisdictions outside of China with all of China's expansion globally. So in American jurisdictions or in, in, in various African jurisdictions because she doesn't have a hope in China. Similarly, our, our Russian contributor, as I, as I mentioned, speaks about the challenges of being a human rights lawyer in a police state, basically. That is, that is the biggest challenge. In what ways does the rule of law shape public narratives when viewing human rights abuses? The most critical thing that um, human rights legal advocacy does is the shaping of public narrative. Um, I've already used the example of Marikana, of the way that, that, that the Marikana story is, is kept alive by the legal cases that the families of the Marikana victims have launched. That is the key work of any strategic impact litigation, is getting to society and helping society see the injustice that is being described inside the court. Um, it is the communicative action of these cases that is the most important thing. Can you highlight the social impact of human rights advocacy and movement lawyering? Well, one would hope that the social impact would be to articulate and entrench the rights that people have as embodied in a constitution or, or any kind of legal code and make sure that those rights are respected and adhered to. That is the first impact. So, in, for example, in this, in this very clear case from South African history, to make sure that pregnant mothers get the meds that prevent them from passing their virus on to their children, right? Very clear. As well as that, the, the second social impact is that the way these cases or these, these campaigns um, give communities, give poor and marginalized people, give people whose rights are being abrogated or denied, give them common cause and can actually be the germ around which movements are built. And in the book, Mark Haywood describes very beautifully the way the AIDS movement coalesced around these cases. I mean, we see in the United States the way the movement for black lives coalesced around cases involving uh, the murders of young black men by police officers, specifically George Floyd. Now, doesn't really matter what happens inside the court when George Floyd's family, you know, sues for some sort of restitution. What matters is the way this enrages and inspires the masses to take action and the way that action causes politicians and governments to revisit their policies. That is the power of human rights legal advocacy. And finally, what lessons can we heed from movement lawyers and activists when pursuing social justice? I think perhaps a key lesson, and it's a lesson that I have learned from doing this work as well, because I have to say from the outset, I'm not a lawyer. As I said, if there's a lawyer, activist, storyteller, trinity, I'm the storyteller, not the lawyer, and, and not really the activist either. I'm a journalist and an author. But the lesson I've learned, which is a lesson that I think um, movement lawyers know and understand and teach, is a lesson about understanding the extent to which you might be an outsider with some expert knowledge because of your education, right? Uh, but that there is such wisdom that resides in 
the people you are working with and trying to help. And it's one of those rules for radical lawyers. Learn to listen. Learn to listen. Don't come in there with your preconceived ideas of what's best for these people. Learn to listen about what their needs are. And then try and use the skills you have, the expert skills you might have as a professional, as a lawyer, as a journalist, as an, as an organizer. Try and use those skills to help those people get what they need and what they want. So I think that, that's a really important lesson. And I think another important lesson is if you are an outsider and if you are someone coming in professionally to help, to what extent do you need to maintain your critical distance so that you can do your job? Like, and I think of this a lot as a journalist. And to what extent do you need to actually identify with and empathize with the people you're working with and see um, their struggle as your struggle too? And, and I think that's a really important part of the work, of, of all of our work. So even if it isn't immediately, even if the struggle for housing is not immediately my struggle, because I am lucky enough to be able to own my home that I live in comfortably, if I understand myself as part of an organism, and that my well-being depends on the well-being of the people who live you know, around me in, 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 in the same polity as me, who are part of the same polity as me, then I understand it as my struggle too, that everybody has decent and affordable housing. So I think that's an important lesson. That was author and journalist Mark Gavissa discussing his book, The Revolution Will Not Be Litigated.